Hello, welcome to the Engaging People podcast. My name is Charles Rogel. I'm a senior consultant here at DecisionWise, and I'll be moderating our uh, session today. Joining me is our president of DecisionWise, Matt Ride. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a particular topic that a lot of organizations uh, struggle with, and that is stress management. Um, specifically, the way we we talk about this, or at least measure this in organizations when we conduct an employee survey, is to ask this question that says, the level of stress in my job is manageable. And many times we will see you know, low scores around this item, there will be other kind of contributing factors that go into this, um, and, and really it kind of ties into you know, the, the priorities, maybe the workload that employees are experiencing. So first, as we talk about this matter, I wanted to um, get some feedback or ideas from you on how an organization can approach this topic at the organization level, and then later we'll talk about what a manager can do to help improve uh, or decrease the level of stress that, um, that employees are feeling on their team. Okay. So organization level first, what are, what are some ideas, um, causes, I guess, of stress in the workplace that you've seen working with clients? Yeah, before I address the, the cause, yeah. I wanna talk about our goal isn't necessarily to eliminate stress. Sure. You and I have both seen that where you have engagement surveys and they don't have enough to do or the stress is super manageable, uh-huh. that's actually not one of our better engagement. Yeah, you don't want to necessarily score high yeah, on you that don't, question. Exactly. And so our goal isn't to eliminate stress. Our goal is to redirect it. Yeah. Stress is a necessary component of work, mm-hmm. right? You have to have friction. You have to have effort. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that it's, that it's appropriate that people aren't burning out, uh, but we're not trying to eliminate stress. Yep, that's a good point. Now, you, you asked about co- like kind of what causes stress, mm-hmm. and there are lots of factors. I mean, certainly just the, the amount of work people are, are asked to do can be incredibly stressful. But I would say for, for us and what we have seen at DecisionWise is stress is caused by uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And that is what's going to happen to me, right? What's... What does this change mean, for example, to um, my job or my my career path? And when you introduce uncertainty, that that creates stress. People rise to the occasion. They can do and deliver a lot when it's clear. Right. But what's hard is when they don't know whether the next three months is going to be manageable or crazy. They want to know, even if it's going to be crazy, they want to know that. Yeah, because it's funny, talking to like folks in a tax department or in accounting or yeah. finance, mm-hmm. they know that certain times of the year when it's year end, they're going to be busy for those two two months, and they expect to work long hours and it be stressful. But then they know what to expect. They've been through it multiple times, and they usually have a plan in place to accomplish it. But, for example, if an organization is going through like a large systems conversion there, if that's handled well, there's usually a lower level of stress, but if it's not, and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of problems that they have to clean up that they didn't account for, then people get really stressed. That's right. And uh, so organizations need to eliminate stress in their employee experience by decreasing uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And I said that wrong. I said eliminate stress. What I mean to do is eliminate uncertainty in order to redirect stress into healthy uh, objectives. Sure. And so as an organization, um, anything else along the lines of kind of decreasing uncertainty? Is that kind of the, the job of the executive team to have kind of a clear message about the strategy and where we're going? And Yeah, I think I've told you this, but one of my favorite quotes by John Wooden, the legendary basketball coach for UCLA, mm-hmm. is he says that uh, coach is just another word for teacher. Yeah. I think CEO is just another word for teacher. And what I mean by that is that your job is effectively to help this organization of people know where they're going. Yeah. And um, I think CEOs get way too um, engrossed in initiatives that they forget to talk to people and they forget to teach them and they forget that they need to make sure people know that the ship's not rudderless and that, that, that they have a plan. Um, I know personally the times I felt most stressed either in business ventures I was running or I was part of is when that unknown was there and and we didn't know. But when you can communicate where you're going, why you're going there, and how it's going to matter, 
then you're going you're gonna to be successful. That's a good point. Yeah, and sometimes I see stress in organizations looking at employee survey results um, be not confined but more acute in certain departments, certain organizations, maybe IT. Uh, I'll pick on them again. Going through a, l- a large conversion process, they um, will experience a high level of workload and, and trying to you know fix bugs and issues all the time. So they kind of get dumped on a lot. So one department might get feel more stressed because of the expectations that other departments have on them. And so there's, there's some of that at play. And then um, another population I see that experiences stress more than others is the manager population. So they're just looking at managers versus non-managers on an employee survey their stress levels will be higher um, for good cause. I mean, usually they have more responsibilities, they're held to, they're accountable for more things, and so you'll see higher levels of stress. Um, and so you have to be careful to understand what is an appropriate level there. Are they okay with it? If they're saying it's not manageable, then what are they, you know, how are they prioritizing that? Are they, what are they sacrificing to try to get other things done uh, when they're looking at yeah, this I mean, I workload? Think op- I think opportunity costs are a plague in a lot of organizations, meaning we are spending so much time doing doing a certain amount of things that we don't have the time to do the higher and best things. Mm-hmm. And I think that creates stress. Yeah. So another, uh, we talked about uncertainty, but another driver of stress is just that, that there's so much to do kind of maybe lower level things uh-huh. that the person doesn't feel like they're accomplishing the more strategic or more important yeah. uh, task that they see ahead or the are their milestones that they want to achieve. So for I think that's what you're saying with the managers. Right. When I look at those scores, that's what I how I interpret those is that they are stressed because they're given too much at a lower level and don't have enough time to do some of the more important work that they have. Yeah, and I think at an organization level, that's just what they need to be sensitive to is what is the capacity of our people? How much more can we kind of pile on? And and even managers when I talk to them about stress level, they'll say um, you know, I really wish I could spend more time developing my team members. You know, I got new people on my team. They're not up to speed yet. That's part of the reason why, you know, we might not be performing or whatever. So if they had more one-on-one time, they could do it. But yet they're so stressed and tasked with other things that they, they sacrifice that. Yeah, and, and it's hard to say no. It's hard to say yeah. no, and you're afraid to say no. You're afraid that if you say no to some of these tasks or if you're afraid that you delay your report that's due, in favor of having a one-on-one sure. or a development conversation that you're going to get dinged for it. And in a world of uh, metrics, you will get dinged. That's right. Right, because we don't give credit for spending the time uh, in that discussion where we're talking about somebody's growth. Um, and so people fill it in with the time that they have. And, le- and, and that's where the employee experience has to be changed. You know, Organizations can do a lot with managers by giving them the freedom um, to say no. I want to share with you hmm. probably an, a personal experience. I, my first job out of, out of college was working for Deloitte, um, and I had a manager, and I've shared this with our company here, who sent us home every night at midnight. <laughs> and the reason was is you could have certainly been nights where we could have been there all night, but she said, you're no good to me, and you're going to make more mistakes. Hmm than you otherwise would. So I'd prefer you go home. I'd like to see you back at seven and we'll start again. And she had this, uh, she had this ability to understand that work isn't measured by quantity. It's, it's measured by quality. Sure. And that sometimes we think it's just quantity and that contributes to this stress. But what we're looking for is quality work. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I think that we have to give managers the freedom to operate and use their judgment to determine what quality work is. Good point. So let's transition now to talk about what a manager can do. So a manager is managing a team. They're they're stressed. Maybe some of them or all of them are stressed at the team level. And so what can that individual manager do to help manage the stress levels of individuals on his or her team? Let's let's borrow your case study from IT. Let's say IT isn't part of a big implementation and they're switching uh, hardware platforms. Yeah. And there are 4,000 computers to provision, to image, um, to get connected to the network, and to go around and do that. That would just, you know, I think most of us would melt under that. Um, I think that a manager who's in charge of it has to do, has to communicate, and then communicate, and then communicate. <laughs> right. Okay. But they need to um, do so in a rhythm. 
one of the challenges is we, we tend to communicate when a need arises. Mm-hmm. But it isn't sometimes people say, oh, we have way too many meetings. We have way too many meetings. We need to just kill all the meetings that ever existed. And just and, get our work done. <laughs> and, I, and I actually disagree. I think that we actually need more meetings. We just need them to be, to be more precise and to be shorter. Sure. And I think there's something to the rhythm of meetings. And so I'm a big fan of one of the things they do in the development world are scrums as part of agile development. You know, that 15-minute stand-up every morning that I think a lot of organizations could do well to adopt that. You take that 15-minute stand-up, people are explaining what they accomplished, they talk about what's blocking them from Mm -hmm. moving forward. It's just 15 minutes, and that can orient everybody, gives the manager feedback, and, and people are clear. Like, so if you go back to our case study, and you have this IT team, they probably ought to be meeting maybe once or twice a day to check in with what has to be accomplished that day, check in what didn't happen, yeah. and over-communicate, but through, do so through a rhythm of short, uh, very precise meetings. Um, that's one way. That's a and suggestion. And that allows you to kind of balance a workload as well, so as people are feeling overstressed, uh, you know, and if someone else who isn't, uh, you know, doesn't have as much work that day can pitch in, help, that sort of thing. Another suggestion, I think, is to cycle, right? So there are aspects of every implementation, every job that aren't the best. Mm-hmm. So when you're thinking about doing that IT, don't assign the same people to do sort of the worst part of the work. Yeah. You know, whether that's opening the box, flipping open the laptop lid and spending 20 minutes configuring, maybe that's the worst part of the experience. Uh-huh. Rotate it. And so you do it for a week on and you do it for a week off. You know, think about maintaining you know we talk a lot about managing people's work Mm -hmm. sometimes we got to manage their energy right and when you think about really that's what you manage you really don't manage work because people's energy ebbs and flows throughout the day and it ebbs and flows throughout the week and the month Mm -hmm. what you're trying to do is get the most energy the most effective thing from them so managing their energy acknowledges that they can't do that day in and day out so you give them a cycle here, we can do this for a week because you know that next week you're going to get to do something more enjoyable that's part of the process. Um, that's an example of managing energy, not just necessarily managing work. There's another, um, actually, I can think of a couple problems. One is um, this this notion or this um, this problem of piling on your best employees. And so you've got your, your star performers who... Um, really uh, do do their work well. They're accurate. Um, they, they do high quality work as well as they do a high volume of work, and so they typically then get the bigger projects dumped on them, the more complicated projects dumped on them, and um, to the expense of maybe someone who's more junior or not as up to par, not doing as much. And so you you then tend to give more work to your best employees, burning them out more, causing them more stress while they're seeing a little bit of unfairness in terms of how other people are being, whatever, treated, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, and, and so there I see that as, like you're saying, are there ways to support or better support your best performers so that they're not so stressed or doing more of the tasks that they enjoy more often as opposed to the mundane items and, um, and really kind of valuing their contribution more in terms of um, the, 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 the pieces of work that are most important but not giving them too much? You're right. I think that managers overestimate their innate ability, uh-huh. meaning if you're going to accomplish something, you're going to keep the stress load, you need to prepare more than you think you, you should. Yeah. The more ones, the ones that are effective, like we've talked about, the ones that can manage a, a hard rollout or maybe a, a merger or an acquisition, they're the ones that have been preparing longer. So they do more work up front and don't rely exclusively on their ability to sort of wing it, yeah. but have really measurable plans. And even if those plans aren't perfect, they create um, certainty. Mm-hmm. And they stick to their plans, and they see it through, and, they're, and they actually accomplish more. So um, another thing managers do is they don't prepare enough, and that, that kind of is evidenced by you know, what we've been talking about, is sure. they just sort of think that, I've got this. Uh-huh. You don't. You don't, <laughs> right. you don't really have it as much as you think you do. And, and to the point where even managers, to, to their own workload and the stress they're feeling, the ability to delegate. A lot of times they feel like they can't delegate. They don't want to put any more on their employees. They don't trust their employees to do as a good job, a, a good a job as they would do. And so um, that inability or that reluctance to delegate leaves them in, in hot water, at least leaves their workload and stress high. 
Uh, at the same time, it kind of denies opportunities for their employees to do yeah. good work. And delegation comes with the notion of don't delegate and give people a list of things to do because that's going to take forever for you to follow up. Delegate accomplishment, meaning this is what we need to accomplish. You're free to figure out how to do it. Yeah. But what I'm going to hold you accountable isn't that a report back that you accomplished these 10 items. What I'm, I need to hold you accountable for is did the objective we defined together happen? Yeah. And that is a more effective way of yeah, delegating, okay. just saying – by June 1st, I need XYZ completed. You know, yeah. I need all of the payroll. It's a merger. I need all of the payroll systems unified. Okay, how are you going to do that? I don't know. You're going to figure that out. <laughs> right. It's time to grow up. You yeah, know? there you go. That's yeah. awesome. And then the last one I was thinking of was um, this topic around performance management. So employees feel a lot of stress sometimes when they feel like other people aren't pulling their weight and their manager isn't holding them accountable and working with them to kind of um, uh, do or at least live up to the expectations that they have for themselves overall. Yeah. Um, And I think that managers, this is one area where I think managers, I I fail at this. I think most managers fail at this. Mm -hmm. People want to know how well they're doing. Yeah. Even if that's not so well, they want a scorecard. And I think we don't want to hurt feelings, and we skirt around this topic. But to your point, you need to hit a head-on. You need to do it more frequently than you think. Um, well, our partner here, Dan Hopes, yeah. has this great analogy, and I think you and I both use this, is he, he likens what a manager does to r- running a basketball game. He said there are times where you have to hold practices before and after the game where you're really focused on um, – preparing for the game, implementing strategy. He says, but in basketball, more than any other sport, you can call a timeout, give quick, immediate feedback, and reset the reset the game and get right back into it. Yeah. His notion is that managers don't call enough timeouts. Mm, yeah. We do a lot of trainings, uh-huh. which are like practices, but we don't do enough timeouts. Like in the middle of the day, you know what? Let's I just want to regroup. Yeah. What's our standard? What are we trying to accomplish? Okay, what can I do to help you to get it back to, to the standard that we know exists around here? And those timeouts are, are a really effective way of eliminating stress because you're, you're, you're realigning that person quicker than letting them fail or letting yeah. them kind of flounder for two or three days. Don't do that to them. That's not fair. Right? Great. So, Matt, anything else that you want to address in terms yeah. of stress management? I wanted, to, I wanted to circle back to what I, to something that I don't think we talked about, but I, I know is that you, you and I both feel strongly about is mm-hmm. just overburdening your star performers. Yeah. That's a huge mistake. Um, just because they can handle it, just because they do good work, you, you have really got to be, have open conversations. It's not fair to them to, to burden them. And more importantly, it doesn't give them freedom to do their best work. Mm-hmm. They don't have time to be creative. They don't have time to come back to you with advice or feedback on how things might be different because they're just head down, and you're going to lose them. They're going to go somewhere else. Yeah, and, the, and that's um, and one other thing I was thinking of is one of our managers here, Kristen Chapman, um, used to uh, just poll her employees. So she had a team of about 10 people, and she'd poll them about their stress level on a scale of 1 to 5 on a regular basis. And use that information in their daily meetings and say, hey, it looks like everyone's, you know, we're, we're scoring a little bit lower lately on this. So how are you feeling? Where are we at? And to your point, one-on-ones are really effective in terms of understanding where people's heads are and how they're feeling and, and helping them navigate or at least improve um, their situation so their stress isn't as high. Yep, yep. I, and so just to summarize, I think probably, you know, our goal as an organization is to reduce uncertainty. And our goal as a manager is to create um, a sense of deliberateness that things to have a plan. Mm-hmm. So kind of structure. reduce uncertainty at an org level and create structure. Thank you. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. Create structure at that team level. But there's nothing better than being part of a good team. Mm-hmm. When you're part of a well-functioning team, I, those are some of the best moments we have in our career and some of the most meaningful moments we may have in life. So it's worth it. Yeah, and I think the bright side of this, especially in our employee survey results, is we see really high team scores, really high scores around people willing to help each other out and pitch in and high accountability on the team level. So that helps to um, mitigate a lot of the stress that they're feeling uh, themselves. 
Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, Look forward to having you join us on a future podcast where we talk about more topics, uh, how to be a better leader and how to change the organization. Thanks everybody. Thank you.